All right, so let's start. And so the reason I'm showing you Every year, um, of this video is not to you know, support, you know, Scotland leaving these horrible birds that want to kill pandas, right? <coughs> it was um, talking about, you know, conservation. We have a limited amount of resources. How do you decide what to, what to conserve, right? We're an extinction threat now. Um, and so this conservationists are arguing that we should just let pandas go extinct because, you know, they eat something that periodically all dies out. We can't take care of the young properly. But expensive in the area of the world's getting more and more people, so we'll put up money into something else instead. And so we're going to talk about conservation with regards to macroevolution in a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to get you thinking about that. So last time we were on selectivity, I think we might finish it. I want to put that up here. <coughs> so here's something I, want, I we looked at a little bit before. This little study where we have the distribution of body size in mammals or in birds, right? We're going to figure out why do we have this particular distribution. And they use very few um, mechanisms that can explain this. So one is you have, within, within a lineage, a, a shift towards increasing body size. And so over time, horses get larger and things like that. Why might that be? Talk about a little, little, little bit, we talked about this a little bit two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if speeds correlate with, with you know, leg length, and if, if your predator is getting faster, you get faster too. Good. What else? Yeah. If females see larger body sizes, more advantageous. Mm -hmm. Right. Sexual selection. If females prefer larger body size or males with larger body size can compete better for females, the selection pressure for larger size of males, and since same basic genetic material from the drag along as well. Right? What else? Maybe the larger species that were taking up those uh, in certain areas of the environment with those certain resources have gone extinct since then and they're like slowly moving. Mm -hmm. Or it could be empty niches where the things that eat, eat the larger seeds, for example, go extinct, and then you can use that way. Good. And so that's what leads to increasing size within a population. And then there's also this long term extinction bias, right, where larger things go extinct more quickly than smaller things, for reasons we've talked about in the past. And finally, there's effects at the lower boundaries where if you get too small, you're just too, too small to survive as a mammal or a bird. Right, you're losing so much heat over your, over your surface area, you have to eat constantly. Right. And so these three factors are thought to explain, you know, much of this distribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hummingbirds are, shrews are. Um, I think in, I think mammals are small, so like two grams. I'm not sure the smallest one for birds is. Yeah. Hummingbirds actually like shut like shut down their metabolism at night, not completely, but they definitely like, lower their body time and less than the bulk active. So like cold blood organisms. Here we see that process, right, where this trend is getting bigger through time, but not always. And then you have you know, speciation processes and extinction processes. Okay. And finally, <coughs> this shows, you know, here's the actual curve, what we see out there. And the dotted line shows the model prediction. You can see you get all four factors playing a role, maps pretty well. You get the three factors that maps pretty well. If you get rid of size and extinction, it doesn't match well. Um, which suggests that that's an important factor. Okay, this is more here's how models can help us understand biology. Okay, so next question Why do organisms get extinct? And this relates to also range size, right? So why isn't everything everywhere? You know, animals can evolve. Great, great, you know, very powerful, right? Why don't we see oak trees going all the way from, you know, North Pole down to South Pole, right? Um, why do we have you know squirrels in certain areas only? 
why don't things why don't things adapt to live everywhere? So something that form just couldn't survive there at all, it would change too much. Okay, yep. If everything was generalized, then as soon as something specialized, it would be. Mm -hmm. All right, so a specialist could be a generalist, perhaps. Right? Um, if you're a company that makes everything, then you have some sort of small niche mark, small niche company that makes you know phones really well, yeah, that might take, off, take over. Um, <coughs> okay, what else? It's the amount of be able to get there, right? So lots of things do really well if they go to Australia, right? Rabbits do well there, camels do well there, um, but they don't get there very easily. So they kind of limit their distribution too. Okay. Another thing can limit their distribution is <coughs> gene flow from central parts of the range. Okay. And so you can imagine, you know, here I have some um, optimal size, so smaller here bigger there, right? Um, <coughs> I can have, you know, genes going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Um, but if they're doing, they start off here and do better here than elsewhere, I have bias gene flow, right? So for this one, most of the immigrants come in this way rather than this way, right? Because the population is doing better. And so we have this movement of alleles out from the center of the range, which can limit the ability of these to adapt, right? Because they're Evolving towards whatever their optimum is, but also getting all this gene flow from more successful ones more in the interior of the range. Okay. And <coughs> this relates to extinction ones we've been talking about. The extinction is basically when your range drops to zero. Right? And so if you have something that wipes out this part of the range, right, for some reason, and now these you know, might have trouble adapting enough to you know, get to the optimum without the subsidy of individuals. Um, but this is a, actually a big open question in biology, is what sets these range limits. Right, so here's some, you know, this is on slide, you can check, check this out later. But, you know, why do you think, why are things limited in their range? Okay. Um, and of course this has relevance with climate change too, as things will have to shift their ranges, keeping their current climatic envelope. Any questions about this? Okay, so I'm going to talk about extinction and looking at using evolutionary principles to figure out both what to save and causes of risk. Okay, so, you know, we can only save so much perhaps, what do we focus our efforts on, and then what is leading things to be endangered. Okay, so let's focus the first one. All right, so I said to you, which area should I conserve? I have enough money to buy one tract of land and give it to Nature Conservancy. You know, I can only buy one. Which one should I get? And each circle here represents a species. Okay. So, put up one finger at this, two fingers at that. Yeah. Are these the same species? I not, haven't told you that. A species is a species. What? Come on. So, one of area A, two of area B. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. So someone said two. Why would someone say? Why would you save two? Um, because area A has more species in it, so the diversity is higher, which means probably better chances of survival. Okay. So they don't need as much help. Right. I see. Okay. And people are saying area area A. Got a better chance of survival, so you might as well buy that one. Okay. Okay. And we see, I mean, already we're having this distinction in what, you know, it's arguing about risk, which is good. Okay. All right, how about now? And imagine that, you know, 
If you don't say area A, all these pieces will extend. If you don't say area B, all these pieces will extend. Which one do you save? One or two? Are you toad haters or panda haters? <laughs> Okay, well, hold your hands up. Let's see. Okay, so now there's lots more disagreement. Okay, the area one people, why do you say the area one? Yeah. Okay, but they're still living there. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's a good thing about the balance of reality. But yeah. <laughs> okay. What else? Well, just, just why you're. Yeah. It's easier to take care of frogs than animals. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we're just talking about like just buying land here, not like keeping them in a zoo. So. Yep. But okay, we think you have a small area. Okay, good. What else? Okay, but what's the what's the bet you're getting at? My bet is okay. You compare. You've got four or five very similar ingredients. Maybe one's a frog, maybe one's a toad. Okay, so keep one frog and one toad. That's great. But once you've got like double frogs going on, I feel like that's not a significant loss of losing one type of frog as compared to losing like, all lions. I mean, I still think pandas should die. So maybe you could take one of those frogs and like substitute for panda. But I, I don't know. I think that I have a similar feeling like with the elephant. It's like, for all, there's nothing that's that similar to an elephant. So the generations in the future would be cool if they could see a black elephant. Okay. So, I agree or disagree with that? There are other types of elephants, too. There's an Asian elephant, and there's actually multiple species in Africa. Yeah. Other elephants. We, we constitute mammoths, too. Yeah. Elephants. So no one cares about conserving insects. It's like there are some you know insects on the endangered species list, but I mean not that many, right? Um, like there's a burying beetle and things like that. Um, the, th the thinking is if you conserve you know an area for like an elephant, so all other little stuff around there would also be conserved. Okay. Back to your point. So I feel who argue that, um, that like somebody you want like you know it's more important to say was you need to age an elephant versus another frog. And <coughs> this thing comes from the idea of phylogenetic diversity. Okay, which however relates to our class. This isn't the only criterion to use for conservation. It might not even be the best one, which sort of shows how macroevolution can relate to conservation. Right? We're thinking about, you know, this area saves this much evolutionary history, this area saves this much evolutionary history. Which is a way of getting at, you know, elephants and pandas are weird things that are worth conserving and because they have so many more traits. Have changed than frogs. So I take area, say, B, I take all those lines, put them there. I take all area A and take all those lines, stack them up there. Right? These measures, if you pull that total branch length, is known as phylogenetic diversity. Okay? So how much evolutionary history is present in that area, in that set of organisms? Why might I care about this? So if something's going to be wiped out, you know, I can recover as much diversity in only 10 million years. This one might take 100 million years. 
That's one, one, one rationale. What else? Has been evolving for longer, and so there's more differences we presume in, um, you know, the amount of genetic change. Now, genetic change doesn't always strictly correlate with time, right? It's, it makes things like dating trees difficult, but overall it tends to correlate, and so we tend to see a sort of pattern. Okay, what else? I mean, in some conservation groups, you know, save certain animals. Right? Yeah. If you have a bat conservation group, they care about bats. They run over bandits when they get to the bat sites, maybe. I mean, yeah. You know, but I mean, that, that's a good focus. So you have those different like, different incentives, too. Sure. Yeah. Do you have any insurance hypothesis for the Right, so because we have so much more diversity in, in genetic diversity and functional traits as well. So by keeping that diversity present, then if something changes, we have diversity to select from in the future. Right. The reason like this, people actually care about phylogenetic diversity in the conservation. Okay. So here's an example. Okay. Here's a set of um, <coughs> freshwater crabs in Sri Lanka. And so they figure out a tree, and then they look at different areas, and they look at the species richness, and phylogenetic diversity. How do they compare? The species diversity and the phylogenetic diversity, species richness and phylogenetic diversity. Fewer species and less diversity in terms of the amount of, of history there, too. Good. So, if you can sort of one area, which would be. Okay, and disagree. That's true. So I could have equal phylogenetic diversity by having something like this or something like this, right? Same total branch lengths about the rock after the rock with a very different pattern. Okay. And again, things we're not thinking about here are you know cost and things like that, right? So there's more building island, lots of more not thinking about that yet. So, but from your actual conservation, that's what thing matters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the species? Yeah. Not clear. Pro pro probably. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And we might have expected though is you could imagine you have You know, two different clades, and maybe this is best at lowland, 
and this is best at Highland, and then maybe these here are in Upland. Right? In that case, you should expect highest phylogenetic diversity in the Upland relative to each of the low in the Highland, which isn't the case here. Um, but you can make something like that happen. It would help you get at that. Okay. So here's just this who shows what we were talking about. Okay. <coughs> and so 50% of free lunches freshwater crab species um, in approximately 72 million years of evolutionary history and threatens extinction. Right, it's another way to argue it. So like, you know, what you call species, what I call a species might differ, but you know, if, if what we're arguing about different species is, you know, are these three species or one species, that doesn't affect phylogenetic diversity as much, right? The same amount of phylogenetic diversity, pretty much. And so, it's another way of arguing for like, conserving certain areas. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, what we can also do with this, with macroevolutionary approaches, is figure out what leads to risk. Right? So we're talking about this other day, you know, looking at fossil things that went extinct and modern things that went extinct, the correlations there. Right? But also we look at things that are currently endangered, not just extinct, and see what's leading to that. Why might I care about that? So, you know, extinction is a natural process. Right? If we prevented all extinction, we'd be messing with nature too. Um, but it's going a lot faster now because of us. Right? And so, you can show that the factors that the selectivity of extinction now is very different from what it is baseline. That's just those factors are due to us, right? which is sort of natural variability or habitat of species. But why else might you care? Mm -hmm. Because it helps with the causation. We can say, okay. You know, all the things that are endangered are all things that can't fly and are tasty. And we should work on the bushmeat market rather than on, you know, conservation of habitat. Like that. Okay. Good. What else? What else species they don't know a lot about, right? So, they discovered new deer species in Vietnam, right? And they found one individual of it, right? Should it should be conserved or not? How could you get that information using this sort of using file genetics? And well, using file genetics and information from other species. Okay, we'll get to that. So what we've done is use file genetic history. Who's heard of this, the red list? Yeah. Yeah. And then information about some traits. Um, <coughs> so, what we've listed is actually this line from the edge score, right? which is um, a distribution of how important certain species are based on their project diversity, right? So, they have, you know, if this species and this species are equally endangered, right, this species represents more evolutionary history than this one because this one has, this one goes extinct, you still have these two, right? So it loses just this much history. This one goes extinct, it loses this much history, right? So that combined with this gives an estimate of you know, how important certain species are. Right? So pandas will show up very highly there versus yet new species of frog. Um, <coughs> and so it also gives you a ranking of like these most critical species that have the most evolutionary history, right? So if a sea account is endangered, you might care about the sea account, you might care about different species of sunfish. This is what this gives us. Okay. Questions about this? Yeah. Do you know the living Oh, um, well, let's see. So platypuses can, they have, Venom in their males have venom in their hind, like li limbs. Um, what else? The teeth. Yeah. That. Oh, anyone know? 
Next, what? Thanks, I'm on Google. Okay. And some shrews might inject them. No, I think I think it's all this is just manless for this one. Okay. Cool. So it's not gonna be one of your conservation priorities. Alright. <laughs> um all right, so imagine we have $8 million to save species, right? Um, this is sort of a practical exercise for you to do right now with, with clickers. So which combo A, B, C, or D saves the most species? All right, so I can only save, if I have only $8 million, you can put it into buying, you know, saving this one, this one, and this one, or this one, and this one, et cetera. So, and you can, The math part of the test. So I'm just thinking out which saves the most pieces. Yeah, given eight million dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you want to use a calculator, you can. Remember, our criterion is just saving the most species. Yep. Okay, if you do one more minute. Everyone ready? There is, we're not scoring it that way, but yeah, there is a red and wrong answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, everyone gets two points, but all right, so most of you said B. Someone who said B, defend that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Someone who said C, defend C. Right. I mean, generally, if you're a conservation organization, you want to keep extra for other things later. <laughs> Party. Um, but again, remember the criterion, saving the most species. So given that criterion, that saves to oh, B says okay. three. Yeah. But I feel like that would be less intelligent to choose that way. Because if it's a frog that's not a frog, then it's a frog that's not a salmon. Right. 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 Well, this is what, so you want to use phylogenetic diversity, but not everyone does. And so if you're working for some place that does, but wants to maximize more species. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. All right. To make you happier. All right. S same thing. But now our optimal criteria is saving the most evolutionary history. You, you can't do this one. Okay, yeah. How would you say in an I'll give you one more minute. All right, and to your answer. And so, so, people who said A, send A. Yeah. The uh, 4 million year branch is close to the 2 3 million year branches. So it may be able to speak shape into those eventually over time. Whereas if you choose uh, the 3 million year branch, to get the all that. What I'm saying, okay, so the 10 million year species, that one you're going to say no matter what, because it's going to be the most differentiation. Uh -huh. But the 4 million year, it, that, it's, it separated back 6 million years instead of, and it's living longer. Been living longer than the three million species, so it may eventually be able to species in something similar to the three million So they think so. I mean, they've been like at this point, they were all the same species, right? And they separated, and then this one speciated again, and this one did. And so, something what you're saying is you have the idea of like a speciation clock, or it takes a certain amount of time before you can speciate again. Is there anything that like this one is ready to speciate again? I think that's something people that actually study and look put into models. Right? We often think that actually you don't need time to let the cooling off period speciate it, right? But some people find that that does fit data better. And so that's interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, so A and, A and C are equally good by this one criteria. And then you can use other criteria too, but they're, they're both valid answers here. Okay, any questions about this? Okay. And so people are doing conservation planning for areas, they can use this sort of information, a sense of like, you know, what species are important species in terms of evolutionary history. So yeah. what are you actually adding 
Um, you basically take the subtree created by the same species. So for N to B, you take this subtree. You go all the way back to the origin of life. Because right, it all these go back very far. And that's just a convention. I mean, you could argue you should do this too, that stem as well. Um, but so we just use what's called crown groups. So you kind of just start all the way up and then stem. Um, that's a convention. That's not something worth, but you didn't need to know for this class. But, yeah. Good question. Okay, any other questions? All right, causes of risk. Okay, so I'm talking this a little bit. Right. Um, so here we have analysis of purpose at all. Okay, um, progress SOC B. Trying to figure out using, you know, controlling for phylogeny and figuring out which species have the most risk. Right? Um, <coughs> why, do, why do you have to control for phylogeny for this? Control for shared of ancestry. One thing, one thing I could do is have just a table of, you know, species, 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 and then things like number of legs. Right? And then things like, you know, ICN status, right? In danger, least concern, and so forth, under correlation. Right? Why, is it, why is that wrong? What, um, what assumptions does do, do doing stats that way have that makes it so you have to you make an incorrect conclusion. We talked about this back in the file genetics lecture. So what are the same traits? Oh, they're the same trait, right? So, yep, okay, good, what else? What does it mean about the species? Well, this, this way this is done, this won't be ordered. We just do a list of, you know, Correlate, you know, trait X with trait Y across many species, or it doesn't matter for that. In terms of looking for a correlation between, you know, this trait and this trait across multiple species, if I just look at the raw correlation, you know, do my, you know, here I have my points. And grab that fit line. Right. What's wrong with just doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So the, the problem with this is there could be other traits. Um, there could be other traits we're not looking at, right, that might matter more than these. Okay. That's always going to be the case. Good, but it, it, it's going to think about what else. Are these independent? These species. True, so that's one way of looking at that's good, right? So there might be that non independence, right? So ecological non independence, good. There's also evolutionary non independence, right? So it could be that, <coughs> you know, these are endangered. I have four, six, four, two, right? You might say, okay, um, you know, two, four often poison and being endangered. Right. But it could be that these all share some trait, like you know, having only one offspring per year rather than forty, something like that. Right. And by <coughs> treating as independent, you know, they have this similar other trait. Um, but the important thing is this you know shared trait that they all evolved. It could be that's the to it. Right. 
Whereas if I have something like this, and I see, you know, endangered, 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 I know it's, you know, they've, they've co-evolved twice, right? many times, right, rather than just once. So our evidence that you know, these have, the one has affected the other. That make sense? So, yeah. No, no, it's it's some trait, like, like the number of legs. No, no, it's like, you know, how many legs do you have? Four legs, two legs, six legs. And that might correlate with extinction rates. For those good, two legs bad. Yeah. We'll talk about it some more and see if you still get it. Okay. Um, <coughs> what do we do here? Here's a phylogeny of three species. Okay. And you can imagine plotting on you know, their endangered status. Okay. And then multiple traits. And so these are having a hard time of it, right? Uh, and it could be because they're eating pixels, it could be because they're eating lookouts. We don't know what traits or correlates with extinction risk. Okay. Um, <coughs> and we have to go multiple species like this, right? Um, we can imagine doing a plot like this, right? And find that, you know, Living on the east side of the river has a higher extinction risk than living on the west side of the river, right? Some correlation like that, right? Um, but the thing is, we don't know if it's side of the river or eating this or eating the guts. And so, by you know, controlling for phylogeny, we know that these species aren't independent of each other and sort of share all these traits. So, we control for this. Um, non independence, yeah. Do we not take into account whatever trait is that using more than anything? Whether we would want to, right? So, so we have evidence that, like, you know, all these can eat this all, but these are people on the feeders, maybe then, you know, it's okay. But there's evidence that we have, you know, this all does have a big effect on this. But it's still only, you know, two ships. It's not five independent things. So we don't want to overcount this as <coughs> looking at you know five different cases of being on the east being uh, worse than being in the west. This is not five versus three; it's actually one many versus one much. So not not as much power as we thought we had. Okay. That sense makes sense. <coughs> and so that's what this group did. They actually used this information to control for phylogeny. And then even so found things like, you know, diurnal species are more prone to extinction than nocturnal species. Right. Um, we can also do how you how we do this, you get your list of conservation concerns, you get data about species, you get a tree, right, and then you can do some sort of correlation. Right. And so here we see, you know, what traits have a phylogeny lead to greater extinction risk. And so, geographic range. Um, being on islands with a big effect. I see we have a, a bigger range, you have um, a lower extinction risk, right? If you have, for an island, you have a bigger extinction risk. If you have a bigger litter size, you have a smaller extinction risk. Because that's what we've been thinking about, right? Here they're actually looking at things that are at risk right now. Okay, right? actually testing it, testing it in America. Okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. How long between having litters? Okay. So in humans, it's you know an average like three years or so, right? But in mice, it might be you know I'm sure months maybe. Other questions about this? And the cool thing then is that if you find a new species, 
um, do you don't know the conservation status of, right? So if we just found this new species, you know, we found one individual, is it endangered or not? What we can do is look at look at this information and say, okay, well, let's see, it has a small geographic range, that puts it at risk. It has a small litter size, that puts it at risk. But it's not on an island that lowers its risk. So you can predict its risk using this regression. Okay. We use the regression to find a new species, put it somewhere, predict what its risk would be. Right? And then know, oh, we should consider this, or no, it will probably be fine. It's a preliminary way to do assessment. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Yeah? It's going to be equivalent, but you don't have a clinical alternative level because like, you need some things in this other thing. Like, you need a number. I don't know. Um, I mean, like, like primary herbivore is like, you know, deer, primary. But then you have lots of things that will eat multiple trophic levels. And so, yeah, I don't know what in that case. But anything you have a discrete category in nature, I mean, it's always going to be something that blurs the lines, right? Carnivore, herbivore, what are the omnivores? And things like that. And so there's always, so that people don't create a rule. We had a paper published recently about um, looking at tr trees versus non trees and you know, how they evolve through time and over space. There's a big fight in, in botany about what's a tree. Right? Something that has a lignin, something that has a persistent above ground stem, what, what definition do you use? There's always these weird edge cases, you know, because like, this tall it has a little, little like, trunk. That tree? Mm -hmm. It's woody. Right? So, yeah, life is messy. It is a tree. You're wrong. Um, <coughs> okay. You also do the same sort of thing and predict what we know about certain species, their extinction risk. Right? Um, <coughs> so, here, black species, their range will expand with climate change based on what we know about other species. Red species are ready to attract. So that tells us, given climate change, which species should we worry about most and you know, put the most effort into monitoring. <coughs> um, and then you can look at what's going to happen in the future. Right? So given what we know about current extinction rates, right, how much phylogenetic diversity are we going to lose? And so you can see, you know, where are you going to lose? And also, you can look for a geographic trends in this. Right? And so, <coughs> you know, with climate change, you know, most European countries actually getting more phylogenetic diversity. Right? So now they're warming up, everything goes live there, it's wonderful. But Southern Europe is losing it. So you can you know, predict those sort of long term changes. So maybe you want to have, rather than you need to preserve for a species here, and if you preserve that species up here. Which could be And again, using phylogenetics to help us predict this information. Right, any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so we can, so we can reconstruct where things occurred back in time, because we can now we can reconstruct speciation rates across the landscape. And so it could be that, you know, things diversify most in this area because of an interesting mix of mountains and valleys and things like that, whereas here it comes to plains, so you don't have lots of speciation. So you can look at that for a long term evolution potential too. People aren't doing that much, but it's cool to do. Alright, I'll see you all on Monday. <laughs>